The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here this morning to study in the word of God. We are studying commandments. And we are specifically studying commandments for Believers that are part of the church, those of us today, we really launched this study as a result of some teaching that Gary did, and he highlighted a scripture that said, Christ said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So I felt like it was important before we return back to our minor prophet study to spend some time looking at the commandments. And right now we're in the middle of a section where we're looking at prohibitions. In other words, commandments that are in the negative form. Don't do this. <laughs> so we're looking at that right now. And one of the things that I mentioned is that in the process of studying these, you're going to notice that when we turn around and study the positive commands, we're going to hit some of the exact same passages. And that's okay, because that will be by way of reminder and we will revisit those passages and look at the positive commands that are also often associated with prohibitions. Scripture often says, don't do this, do this. And so we will end up hitting those passages twice as a result of the way we're doing this study. Before we begin our study this morning, you know it's imperative for us to be under the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit. It is only through his ministry that we're able to understand spiritual truth. And the word of God, make no doubt about it, the word of God is spiritual truth. And so we must be spiritual. It's mentioned more than once in scripture that we must be spiritual. So this is a tradition, if you will, or a custom, if you will, that we have at this church and others like it, that we begin the Bible class with a moment of silent prayer. It's an opportunity for confession of sin if necessary. It's also an opportunity for each and every one of us to humble ourselves before the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be able to gather like this, to be able to spend this time studying your word. We pray that you would bless this time, that each and every one of us would set aside distractions and remain focused on the lessons that you prepared for us. Father, we so desperately need the truth of your word. It is the nourishment that our souls require. And as we study your word this hour, we pray that we would be ready in humility to receive the word implanted. We pray all of these things in Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, last Sunday, we were looking at this particular bit of information. We noticed that we have some lessons here about interactions with others. We have great freedoms in Christ, and we should realize that those freedoms are to be exercised in love. We can, in our freedoms, even though we have all the freedom we need to do a particular thing, we can offend others in the process, and we don't want to do that. If we are indeed operating in the sphere of love, we will not want to offend others. We will be concerned about the health of their soul, and we will operate, take action, speak, whatever we do, we will do it in a way that will not offend others. We also looked at an exhortation not to be children in our thinking, and this is not talking about the typical thing that you might think of in terms of I need to know how to pump gas into my car, or I need to know how to do this or that or some other such thing. This is talking about spiritual 
We should not be children in our thinking in terms of our spiritual lives. We need to grow up in the faith, in other words. And that's an exhortation from Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 20. We should not be children in our thinking. This is all review, by the way. We also should not be deceived about the influence of bad company. 1 Corinthians 15. We should not be deceived about that influence. Bad company can cause problems. Now, as we emphasized last week, we need to be out in the world and among unbelievers in order to be able to have a witness. And we're going to be out in the world among unbelievers. This is talking about the close interaction. Those people that are in our inner circle. If we have people in our inner circle that are bad company, then we will be influenced in a negative way by them if we do not have the protections of the Lord. So the idea is don't put yourself in that position. Don't make provision for bad company to influence you in a negative way. And we see the exact same thing reinforced in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. We should avoid close relationships with unbelievers. Let's go back to that passage. That was what we finished with last time. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, I think it is, 14 through 18, yes. It says, do not, this is a prohibition, command in the negative, do not be bound together with unbelievers. And that, that language of being bound together is important. It doesn't mean you can't be in the same room with an unbeliever. It doesn't mean you can't have a conversation with an unbeliever. It means you're not supposed to be bound together with an unbeliever. For what partnership... And that's important language too. What partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So in other words, partnerships and fellowship, that should be with like-minded believers. Partnerships and fellowships should be with like-minded believers, not with unbelievers. Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So this is the idea that when... We are born again. We, at the time, we may be living a certain kind of a life, and we may have certain associations, and we may have certain friendships, whatever we may have going on in our lives. And we may discover as we begin to learn the Word of God that these are unhealthy relationships that we have. And this is telling us that we need to come out and be separate. We need to separate ourselves from those associations that might imperil our spiritual walk. Now, as we talked about last week and Gary brought up, there's specific instruction about not leaving an unbelieving spouse. And I believe the reason for that instruction is because of the fact that there is this message that says associations of this nature can be harmful to us in our spiritual lives. So... Paul gave specific instruction that if you're a believer and you're married to an unbeliever, don't separate yourselves in that situation because there's an influence you might have on the unbelieving spouse. So there is peril. Even in that situation, there is peril. A believer that's married to an unbeliever is in a perilous situation as far as a negative influence from their spouse. That's something we need to acknowledge. There is a negative influence there. But because the bond of marriage is an important part of God's plan and because of the divine establishment institutions of marriage and family, it's important to not break out of that relationship and instead to recognize that you might have an influence that's a positive one. I recommend, by the way, if you... Let's say you were in a... This, I'm going to give an example. Let's say you were in a business partnership... And in that business partnership, uh, you were working with unbelievers, and then you got saved. 
And now you're a born-again believer, you're saved, and you have partners that are unbelievers. You may have to strongly consider whether you want to continue in that business relationship. But let's say you come to the faith conviction that you need to separate yourself from that. You don't need to be in a business relationship with unbelievers. That's, and I'm talking about an intimate partnership business relationship. So you have to break out of that relationship. I still recommend that you maintain an influence with those individuals. In other words, maybe you stop being a business partner with them, but you don't totally disown them because you want to still have a witness in their lives. You want to still have an opportunity to be a positive influence. So we want to recognize that there is a positive influence aspect to this, but close, close-knit binding is problematic for us in terms of being unequally yoked. Yes, sir. Right. And so putting this into perspective, it says, for a living temple, for a temple of the living God, this is God says, I will dwell among them and, dwell, and be their God, they shall be my people. That makes sense, mm-hmm. even for the children of Israel, as well as it does for the church age believers. Yes. And that, and then we're going to come out from their midst and be shepherds. That all makes perfect sense. What's the next thing mean in terms of, and do not touch what is unclean? Because the Old Testament had a very, very specific uh, you know, connotation of what they could and couldn't do and touch. What does that have to do with the church age? So the question or the point being made and then the question that was asked is that the first part of verses 16 and 17, quotations of Old Testament scripture, I will dwell in them and walk among them, I will be their God and they shall be my people, and then come out from their midst and be separate, that that applies both to Israel and to us today. It's easy to make the connection. In the reference, and do not touch what is unclean, Uh, recognize that the message about touching what is unclean for Israel, if they touch something that is unclean, they might not be able to participate in worship for some period of time. So the picture that's painted in the Old Testament scriptures of touching what is unclean is that you have disqualified yourself from worship. And what the warning is here for us today, we don't have those ceremonial ritualistic kind of associations but the warning the principle if you will the secondary application for us today is that if you are indeed bound together partnership with fellowshipping with that which is unclean because remember that's the context binding together partnership fellowship if you have a bound together relationship a partnership relationship a fellowship relationship with that which is unclean it very possibly is going to disqualify you from worship in the sense that you're going to be influenced by them. You might be carnal because of the influence of them. You might not, for example, you might be in a, in a relationship with someone who convinces you, that whole church thing, you can go whenever you need to go to church. We're playing golf on Sunday morning, man. Come on, play some golf with us. And so instead of going to church on Sunday morning, you decide to go to the golf course. Or you're in a situation where you are at your office in a partnership relationship and you're at your office and a customer comes in the door and you have the opportunity to give them the gospel and you do. And your partners come up and say, look, I, that, all this Christian stuff you have going on, that's great, but don't bring it here to the office. You shouldn't bring it here to the office. And so what's going to happen is your ability to worship is going to be limited because of your binding together with that which is unclean. And so it's not a direct application, it's a secondary application. Does that make sense? There is, a, there is a, an influence when you're around, not just around, but when you're bound together with those that are unbelievers, there's an influence that will actually inhibit your ability to worship. Now, what is our worship today? Presenting our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, right? We worship with our lives, everything that we do. We don't, we don't just worship when we sing hymns. We don't just worship when we're at church. We worship every moment of every day because we present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. And what the point is, is if you're bound together with those that are unbelievers, then what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to do that 24-7. It's going to limit your ability to worship. Does that make sense? 
So it's an, it's a, it's an, 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 an uh, impediment. That's the word I was looking for. It's an impediment to your worship. This is new material. In Galatians, we should not subject ourselves to a yoke of slavery. It says here, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, I hope everybody in the room understands the context of this in Galatians. In the letter to the Galatians, the Galatian believers, Paul is writing to them because they had a problem. They were born-again believers in Jesus Christ, but they had a heritage that was Jewish. And so what these believers were doing is they were reverting back to the traditions, to the rituals, to the patterns that they had in their Jewish religion, in their faith or in their way of life, if you will, that they had as Jewish individuals. And so the warning here is, look, you've been set free. We're not under law, we're under grace. Who is it that teaches that better than anyone? Paul, right? We're not under law, we're under grace. So if we're under grace and we have great freedoms, then why would we subject ourselves again to a yoke of slavery? Why would we force ourselves back into some kind of a system that controls us through regulations and rules when, in fact, we don't live under that law anymore? We're not under that Mosaic law the way the Jewish people were. Instead, we are under the law of liberty, the law of love. That's what we function in, the law of liberty, the law of love. Those are the two words that guide our way of life. We have great freedoms in Christ, but we operate in love. So why would we subject ourselves? Now, this is very important in this discussion because what are we studying right now in this phase of this opportunity we have to learn the commandments? What are we studying? Prohibitions. Now, doesn't it sound like wow, you're teaching us all these prohibitions, pastor. Isn't that just a bunch of rules and regulations and limitations? And Doesn't it seem like that? The difference is what? Anybody tell me what the difference is? These are prohibitions that are given to us by the Lord that require our volition. It's a volitional choice. Do you want to obey this or not? And that was true of the law as well, by the way. That was true of the law as well. But what the biggest difference is... I mean, the laws have physical activities. The laws also have physical activities. But these are all... And these are primarily from the soul perspective, right? Of what we do in the soul. Anybody else? Well, the law was from God. The law was given from God to Moses. He handed it to the people of Israel. So what's the difference? This is all done in love. That's exactly right. This is all done not as a rigid set of rules that we have to somehow obey in order to somehow satisfy the righteousness of God. Instead, these are, these are commandments given to us that we do because we love the Lord. We're not trying to... We recognize. We recognize from the beginning that in and of ourselves, we have no righteousness. Right? Right? So we're not trying to somehow achieve righteousness through our works. You see what I'm saying? We're not doing the law trying to achieve righteousness through our works. Instead, what we're doing is we're voluntarily, voluntarily participating in these things because we love the Lord. It's a whole different approach to things. Also, keep in mind that even the people of Israel, even the people of Israel 
were supposed to have recognized that the law was given them to be instructive, right? They were supposed to have understood that the law was an instructive thing, an instructive tool for them. And instead, they ultimately tried to use the law to establish their own righteousness, which they were never going to be able to do. Anyway, there's a fundamental difference in that these things are being done out of the love of the Lord, and these things are being done because we want to do them, not because we have to do them. So it's a huge difference, a huge difference. So we recognize that we, are, we have great freedoms today. We are not under a rigid set of rules. Instead, what we have is we have the Word of God, which gives us instruction. And all of these commandments that are given to us are also instructive, right? And that's, again, the law was supposed to be like that. But if you think about it, we don't have this umbrella, umbrella over us of a whole bunch of regulations and rules, 623, I think people have counted. Instead, we have the Word of God, which instructs us, gives us commandments, and then we're asked to obey these commands in order to be blessed. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and observe it, right? That's it. That's the answer. So it's actually, we're not, we're not controlled by this. We have an opportunity for blessing through this. So it's a very different situation. So we don't want to put ourselves under a yoke of slavery. I will tell you this, that this is an interesting phenomenon in that many believers today uh, voluntarily put themselves under that kind of yoke of slavery. They want that kind of a rigid system, and it's not necessary. We have, it, we have the Holy Spirit. We can go right back to what we just looked at. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. He is the one who's going to guide us in what we need. We don't need the law. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to instruct us in what we need to do. Yes? So the, is there also a secondary interpretation of this in that the whole, uh, if Christ, we were set free, is that the redemption part, we're not supposed to go back to the yoke of slavery being our old sin nature in this case? Is um, no, this isn't really talking about, although I would say that, I would say I will talk to that. I will talk to that. That's not what this is really talking about. Paul is warning them. That's a great question. Paul is really warning them about going back to the yoke of slavery that is being under the law again when they, when they weren't supposed to be under the law anymore. But Gary brings up a good point. In addition to that, we often ourselves voluntarily submit ourselves back to the slavery to our old sin nature. We've been set free from that too, right? Right? We've been set free from being under the slavery of our old sin nature. And we now have the opportunity to glorify God in this body, even though it's a, a corrupted body, a body of sin. We have the opportunity to glorify God in this body because we've been set free from that sin nature. But we often, yes, Gary, you're right. We often voluntarily put ourselves under that yoke of slavery. But that isn't what Paul's talking about here. But the principle still, uh, still is a valid one to bring up, I think. Uh, we should not abuse the freedoms. You notice this has a similar theme to what we've already been looking at, Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, talking to believers, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But, and see, here's where we get the answer, right? Here's where we get the answer. But through love serve one another... For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, Old Testament saints, the Israelites, they were under the law. That was instructive. It gave them a set of rules to follow. Today, we have great freedoms in Christ. But what do we have? We have two wonderful provisions from God to guide us in our daily walk. One, God the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Two, the overriding principle of love. If you think about it, if you just operate, if you just consider things from the perspective of love, and this love is a love that cares about others more than yourself, if you consider things from the principle of love and you rely upon the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you in your life, you really don't need a rigid set of rules. So why are we learning these prohibitions? Because we want to know the commandments that we can keep to show Christ that we love him. That's why. So we don't want to use our freedom and into an opportunity for the flesh. 
We don't want to take the great freedoms that we have in Christ and use that to serve ourselves, use that to fulfill our own selfish passing pleasures of the flesh or whatever else. Instead, what we want to do is serve one another in love. That's what I've told you before. The truth is the freedoms that we have in Christ give us the ability to do an almost unlimited number of things in our lives in order to glorify God. Look at what the, look at, this is another difference. Look at what the Israelites had in terms of their, their ability to show God and to worship God. They had a, a one, one way that was given to them to worship through the, the mechanism of the law. We have in the freedoms we have in Christ almost an unlimited number of different ways we can worship God and show him, show him honor and bring him glory. Unlimited. But at the same time, that freedom that we have is something that we can use in a negative way. It's something we can use in order to dishonor God. And we don't want to do that. We should not be deceived about reaping and sowing. Galatians 6, 7, a very, very important passage. Reaping and sowing. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. It talks about different things in this passage. This is actually a fascinating passage. It says, the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, this is a, a sowing and reaping passage. This is not a salvation passage. So what does this mean? If I sow to the flesh, from the flesh I'll reap corruption. What does the flesh have the ability to produce? Nothing but corruption, wood, hay, and stubble. stubble. The, flesh is, the flesh doesn't do anything but produce corruption. What about the Spirit? If we sow to the Spirit, what happens there? Does this mean this, this is salvific in nature? Is this talking about salvation here? Or is it talking about reaping the eternal life that we already have right here and right now? Remember, I've told you, this is just the first stage. I'll draw it on the screen once again as a reminder. Going through time. I don't like that color for that. Going through time in our lives, at some point we were born, we're moving along in time, and at some point, at some point, we trust, we trust in Christ. That faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, and we are saved. Ooh, that's cool, whatever that was. All right, so at that point in time, we have trusted in Christ and we are saved. That point right there forward is eternal life. Actually, I'm going to use a different term, which we could have used in there. I'm going to use the term everlasting life. Because eternal life really is what God has, because there is no beginning and there is no end. We rather really have everlasting life is a better way to phrase it. But here's the deal. That moment in time, if you haven't noticed but I reckon you probably have. The moment you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you were born again, you were saved by God. We're going to talk about that in our passage of the week this week, the part of what we mean when we say we're saved. But we were born again, we were saved at that moment. You probably noticed that you didn't just suddenly disappear and go to heaven. It didn't happen that instant, did it? Instead, you're living on in this world. So at some point here, unless the rapture happens, we're going to assume that it doesn't in this case, you're going to experience physical death. And if you remember, we talked about this before, this is just stage one of eternal life, everlasting life. It's just stage one. You right now are in stage one of the everlasting life the, that you received at the moment of your salvation. So you can reap in accordance with that everlasting life or you can reap in accordance with the flesh. 
As the flesh, is the flesh going to live on forever? No. No, this flesh will not live on forever. But I have an everlasting life because of my faith in Christ. So this passage is talking about sowing and reaping. But here's what's very important about this passage. Don't take eternal security as a life insurance policy. In other words, because you know you trusted Christ and because you know that you have everlasting life and that you will one day be in heaven, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. In other words, just because you're saved and just because you're in the hands of God and he's holding on to you and will never let you go and none of those that are Christ's will ever be lost. Just because you understand eternal security, do not be deceived. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. So how you live, how you live your life, stage one of your eternal life matters. You're either reaping according to that eternal life or you're reaping according to the flesh. Depends on how you're sowing. So don't be, don't be deceived. It matters how you live your life. We should not walk in futility as we did when we were unbelievers. Ephesians 4.17 So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Now, here's the important thing. When you see a passage like this, this exhortation, I say that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. It means that you can do that. You can ignore this exhortation. You can ignore this command. And you can. You can walk just as the Gentiles also walk. Now, it doesn't mean that you somehow become an unbeliever again. And by the way, that's what Gentiles means here is unbelievers. That's how it's used here is to refer to unbelievers. Does that mean that if you start walking that way, that somehow now you're no longer God's child, that somehow you're no longer in his family? No, it means that you just made a foolish decision in your life. You rejected all the blessings that God has for you and you decided to walk in a manner that you used to walk. That every unbeliever can walk in. That's not what God has designed for you. He's designed great blessing for you. He's designed a life that is full of joy and peace and contentment. But it comes as you walk in a new way in the newness of life, in the newness that God instilled in you and created in you at the moment of your salvation. But far too often, and I'm guilty as well, folks, far too often we as believers choose to walk the old way. This is an exhortation that we do not walk that way. Walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. And I love that expression because that's really what it is if you think about it, a futility makes no sense why do we do that it's because of a lack of faith somehow in our souls we question whether or not the joy that god will give us is enough or that the peace that we get from god is going to keep us and hold us instead We look after, we seek after, I should say, the passing pleasures of the flesh. All of us do it. And it's because we know those things. We're familiar with those things. We know what that's all about. And so we go for that in spite of the fact that we know from the Word of God that there's much more for us, much more. So it's a lack of faith. So when you find yourself falling into that, that's one of the things you can pray for is say, my Father in heaven... Help me in my unbelief. Somehow I doubted you. 
somehow I felt like I needed to go back to my old ways and I didn't trust you in, in the new way that you've provided for me. So we're not supposed to walk in that futility. This is an interesting one. We should not go to bed angry. Ephesians 4.26 And 427, by the way, uh, goes right with it. That's our next one. Uh, so I'll bring that up on the screen. We're not supposed to give the devil any opportunity to lead us astray. 427. 426 says, um, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Well, verse 26 is kind of a fascinating one because be angry and do not sin. That means uh, there's a form of anger that's not sinful, right? Most people refer to it as something like righteous indignation or something of that nature, but there is a form of anger that is not a sinful anger. But I submit to you, and I have submitted to you before, that most of the time when we get angry, it is unrighteous. It is normally a reaction we have that is from the sin nature that causes us to become angry. If God is angry at something, do you think you should be angry at it? I think the answer is yes, if something that God is angry with. But the question is, when you get angry, is it because you're joining God and His like-mindedness about the thing that you're considering and you're angry because you know it violates God's righteousness? Or... Is there actually a more selfish motive in your anger? And that you have to ask yourself. But here it says, be angry and yet do not sin. And then it says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, quite frankly, I believe that applies to whatever kind of anger it might be. Even if you have righteous indignation, if there's something that's going on that you believe you ought to be angry about because it's an offense to God, and you share God and His anger. You share in God's anger, I should say. This is this principle: do not let the sun go down on your anger. Applies to that as well. Now, I said go, to, but you shouldn't go to bed angry. And I think that's the principle here. In other words, you should not, you should not let the day end while you're still angry. It's an interesting. It's an interesting principle. It's sometimes hard. You're absolutely right. Sometimes it's hard. But the truth of the matter is, it's instructive from the Word of God to not let that happen. And I think verse 27 is important because I think it's coupled with that. Especially if you go to bed in unrighteous anger. I think you're actually giving the devil an opportunity in that. If you, in other words, here's what I mean by that. If you remain angry, if something happens to you and you get angry about it in unrighteous anger and you remain angry like that all the way until the end of the day and you go to sleep still angry because of whatever it was that happened, look at that window of opportunity you just gave the devil right there. That entire time that you were angry, you just opened the door for the adversary to come in and, and have a really bad influence on you. So my assertion is that the verse 27 is, is coupled to this because... Remaining angry over something just gives the devil an opportunity. He's going to use that. And I, I'll be honest with you, I was having a conversation with Ken yesterday when we were here. Well, actually, it was after the prayer meeting. It was when we were working in the kitchen in there. And he was talking about how he's kind of stopped listening to talk radio, started listening to music, and we both agreed that part of the problem with listening to talk radio is all it does is get me fired up. I get... I get all wound up listening to things on talk radio. So, you know, there's a principle there. I mean, if you're going to get upset about something and it's going to bother you for the rest of the day, uh, that's, not worth, that's not worth losing an entire day over whatever that is. I mean, I think we need to be smart. We need to be aware of what's going on in the world around us. But that's different than becoming angry about it. The principle of not giving the devil an opportunity obviously goes beyond just this anger issue, Right? I think it's coupled together here because of the anger issue is an opportunity. You open the door for the devil. When you're angry and you're carnal in your anger, that's an open door opportunity for him. But the principle of not giving him an opportunity goes beyond. 
It goes to every aspect of your life. Remember, let's go back, uh, take a look. Uh, where is it? Do, 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 do. Right here. Luke chapter 4 discusses, you can see the pericope there, it discusses the temptation of Jesus. And you guys have learned this before. He was led out into the wilderness. He was tempted by the devil himself. Again, I've told you before, I don't think I rate the attention of Satan himself. I, 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 think, I think we all find ourselves where we're worthy of the attention of his minions. But I, I don't think I rate the attention of the devil himself. But Christ certainly did. And he was tempted during that time. And every single time he answered with Scripture, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Um, Satan said, I'll give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. wish excuse me. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. As Satan went on to say, look, throw yourself off of here and the angels will protect you. I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus answered and said, it is, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to, test, to the test. Then, this is the verse I wanted to highlight. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Now, when was the opportune time in the life of Christ? Turns out there really wasn't one, right? Because he was without sin. But nonetheless, he attempted to take an opportune time, certainly working through Judas Iscariot, right? And all the things that happened there. But recognize that in our own lives, there's a principle here with verse 13 that let's say that you have a test come your way and you fail or succeed either way, success or failure either way, when you are back walking in the light again, you might be left alone for a little while. You might, the adversary might leave you alone, but he's going to leave you alone until an opportune time. And this is the same, this couples right together with that. We don't want to give the devil an opportunity. We don't want to make provision for his opportune time, do we? So no matter what you do, regardless of whether it's anger or not, don't make opportunity for the devil. Oh, that's right. And so in this, in, this incident, in this incident we're talking about here in the wilderness, Christ didn't open the door for an opportunity. He was led by the Spirit to be there. It wasn't really an opportune time for the devil. He thought it was, though, right? He thought it was, but it really wasn't an opportune time. But the principle, I agree with that, by the way, that this wasn't really an opportune time, but Satan tried anyway. But this principle of the opportune time, that's a principle we need to remember in our own lives. In other words... Uh, he prowls about like a lion seeking to devour, right? He is looking for the opportunity. So don't give him an opportunity. Don't give him an opportunity to get you. Stand firm in the strength of the Lord. Stand firm with the armor of God on you, protecting you from the schemes of the devil. We should not, we should not allow ugly words to come out of our mouths. We were right there next to that in that passage. Let's go back. says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. And this, if you want to know what that means, here's the answer. A lot of people debate, what does it mean unwholesome? Here's your answer. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Are your words edifying? Are your words appropriate for the need of the moment? Are your words giving grace to those who hear? If not, ask yourself the question, am I speaking unwholesome words? Am I tearing someone down that God is building up? 
Why am I doing that? Why am I opposing God? God is in the building business. Remember, we talked about that. We are in the present time. God is in the business of building up the body of Christ. If he's doing that, why would we tear anything down? It's almost, I mean, I'm going to paint you a picture. It's almost like when we were having the work done on this, this room, when it was being expanded, it's almost as if when the guys came in and they started hanging up the sheetrock, you walked in right behind them and just started tearing them down. Kind of insanity is that? The guys are hanging sheetrock. We're trying to build a building here, add on to the room, and you're walking in and you're pulling sheets of sheetrock off of the wall? That's what we do when we tear down other people with our words. We're undoing the work of God. He's trying to build them up, and we're tearing them down. So the answer about the unwholesome word is that which is not edifying, that which tears down. And so you really, that's all you need to know. Our words should be that which builds others up. And this is what we'll end with here. We should not grieve the Holy Spirit who sealed us. Very next verse. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, the moment, the moment that you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you were sealed by the hand of God. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's a seal that cannot be broken. That's a seal that has the force of God Almighty behind it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a little older and these days there are actually some containers I buy from the, or my wife actually mostly does the shopping, but containers we get from the grocery store that I have a heck of a time getting the seal off of them. In fact, I'm pretty sure some of those caps on some of the medicine are actually adult proof, not child proof, right? That it's almost impossible to get those things open. But there are some seals that are on containers today that are really difficult sometimes to get off. Wouldn't you agree? Yet, ultimately, with tools or whatever other means we may try, we can break that seal. But the seal by which we were sealed by the Holy Spirit is a seal that cannot be broken. It has infinite strength behind it. And we have been sealed by God, and we are His child, and we will be in heaven with Him. And I cannot wait for that day. But look at the warning here. The very one that sealed you, God the Holy Spirit, we have the capacity to grieve Him. And you get an idea of how that comes about in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. When we act like that, bitter, angry, wrathful, all the clamor and slander and nonsense that comes out of our mouths, all the things that we do, the malice, we grieve the Holy Spirit, the very one who sealed us, the very one who made our faith in Jesus Christ effective for salvation. We grieve Him. He dwells in us. All of us. He has dwelled in us from the moment of our salvation, but we can grieve Him, we can quench Him. We're supposed to be filled by the Spirit, but often we're not. You're also, let me back up, you're supposed to do 23 and 24? Yes. Yeah, 23 and 24, good point, Jesse, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You've been created anew by God. At the moment of your salvation, you were created anew. And you have an opportunity to live in that newness of life and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But all too often we go back and we live our lives as we did before, just as the Gentiles also walk, as it said, in the futility of our minds. And if we live the way it says here in verse 23 and 24... And by living that way, putting on the new self, the actions reflected from us are in verse 32, we're kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. 
just in God, as God in Christ has also forgiven you? If that's the case, then we're not grieving the Holy Spirit. We're not, but we can. That's what I'm trying to tell you about this morning is we can grieve the very Holy Spirit himself who dwells in us. And when we do, the Holy Spirit just throws up his hands and says, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Actually, that's not what he does. The Holy Spirit begins a very important ministry in your life and in my life when that happens. And that is his convicting ministry. Because he will convict us of what we're doing wrong. If we only were willing to listen. That's the problem. I don't know about you, but I'm very stubborn. And when I find myself fallen into sin, sometimes I'm too stubborn to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he has to keep poking and prodding and it gets stronger and stronger and more intense and more intense until finally my hard head is willing to listen. But he never gives up. But the exhortation this morning, and this is what I'm going to close with, the exhortation this morning is don't grieve him in the first place. I was having a conversation with some folks from the church here the other day. The the point of the scriptures over and over again is, yes, God has, made, God has made provision for us. He made provision for our salvation. He made provision for us that in our daily walk, when we mess up, we can confess our sins and be restored to fellowship to, so that we can walk in the light. Yes, that's true. But our lives should be characterized by the walk in the light, not by a walk in darkness that needs to confess, right? We should, we should endeavor to live a life that is in the light, as Christ is in the light, that glorifies God, that pleases, if you will, the Holy Spirit within us, not grieving the Holy Spirit within us. And God's made all provision for that too. Everything we need in order to live that life of godliness, right? Everything we need has been provided for us. And yet, just like the Israelites... All too often we fail. So my exhortation is don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He's there for you every day. He's a wonderful provision from God himself that you would be able to use the Holy Spirit in your everyday life, every moment of every day. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We'll come back and we'll review that next time. But since we are out of time, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we look at these passages that we're studying that have the prohibitions and we recognize these are not harsh rules that are restricting us and keeping us from having fun in our lives. No, that's not the case. Every one of these things that we study makes perfect sense that if we're walking with you and we're living in a sphere of love and we're, we're exercising our liberties in love, these things are not hard to obey. These are easy things to obey. We're going to want to do these things. So, Father, my prayer is that you'll work into our hearts such that we will not find these things burdensome at all. Keeping your commandments is not burdensome when we love you. So help us to grow in our faith. Help us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Help us in our weakness when we fall short. Give us, give us that desire and give us the faith that we need, Father, to be able to walk in a manner worthy all the time, walking in the light, glorifying you. Help us do that which is pleasing in your sight, not that, that, not that which is going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Father, we know we have weaknesses, but when we are weak, we are strong in your strength if we are looking to your strength. So, Father, we ask you for that strength. We ask you to correct us when we need it. Help us to day by day moment by moment, become a little bit more Christ-like in our walk and help us to honor Him with our lives. We pray all of these things in His most precious and holy name. Amen.